All right, and welcome back. Thank you again for joining us. The next session we have here is uh, one of the keynotes uh, for this conference this year uh, with the great David Friedman. Uh, at the same time, uh, we've got then Brian Kaplan, as I just said cheekily offline earlier, the, the second greatest living anarchist philosopher at the moment, because um, he's here with David. At the same time, we have a breakout room. If uh, Topher's enticements about a debate on Western civilization uh, whet your appetite, that wasn't an hour ago, that is now. So if you're a, a paying customer, jump into that breakout room. But uh, otherwise, stick around. And uh, Mark, would you like to introduce? Well, both of these speakers that we're going to hear from now, David Friedman and Brian Kaplan, their, their books have just been um, so in-depth and so well-researched and just interesting and fun. You can learn so much from these two speakers. And both of them are also heroes of mine in terms of unschooling and homeschooling as a way of expressing freedom and passing that on to the next generation. So I'm really looking forward to this keynote address. First up, we're going to hear from David Friedman, one of the people whom the Friedman Conference is named in favour of. Thanks very much, David. Thank you. Uh, I had hoped to finally come to Australia for this conference this year, but unfortunately the coronavirus intervened and I'm glad you managed to find a solution to that problem by putting the whole thing online. Uh, the fundamental political problem from the standpoint of an economist is not what laws we should have or how they should be enforced. It is how do we make it in the interest of the people who make the laws to make good laws and how do we make it in the interest of the people who enforce the laws to do a good job of it? And that's essentially the same as the problem for producing automobiles or food. Uh, an economist cannot tell you, should cars be electric or should they be run on gasoline? But he can tell you that if you have a free market system, the decision to switch to electric will be made at the point when an electric car becomes a better deal for the customer than a gasoline car. An economist can't tell you what crops should be grown, but he can tell you that in a market system, it will be in the interest of private farmers to choose that crop that gives them the best return for their efforts and thus is the most value, valuable uh, of the crops they can grow for their customers. Uh, so the basic problem is how do you make it an individual's interest to do things worth doing and not to do things not worth doing? Where worth doing basically means where the net benefit to everybody affected is larger than the cost. Uh, there are two solutions to this problem, only one of which works. The obvious solution is central control. The obvious solution is that somebody figures out what everybody should do and makes them do it. That works tolerably well for very small groups, perhaps on the scale of a football team, though not never having been part of that, maybe I'm exaggerating, or a very small business. But it breaks down sometimes catastrophically at the scale of millions of people. Uh, the less obvious solution, the one that works, is decentralized. You somehow set things up so that each individual makes the right decisions, and the way you do that is to set things up so that when an individual makes a decision, he bears most of the costs and receives most of the benefits. So that if benefits uh, to everybody are larger than costs, usually benefits to him will be larger than costs. And he will therefore make the right decision and not make the wrong decision. How that works in an ordinary market to understand in detail requires a semester or two of price theory, but I think the basic logic of it is pretty, si pretty simple. Uh, the solution to the political system, I want to argue, is the same solution. That the current political system is the centralized system. Uh, you have a legislature to make laws. You have government agencies to enforce the laws. And the question is, what makes it in the interest of the legislature to make good laws or of government actors to enforce laws in a way which provides net benefits, including government actors, uh, police, regulators, judges, and everybody in the system. And the theory is that democracy does it. Uh, the theory of democracy is that if the politicians don't do the right things, we vote them out. 
And the problem with the theory of democracy is what economists call the public good problem, that the private system for getting the right things done works as long as the individual bears most of the cost and gets most of the benefit of his actions. But that's not the case for the individual voter. An individual voter figuring out what the government ought to do is not a trivial problem, especially in a society as, as large and complicated as ours. In order for a voter to actually know who is the good guy, for some reason, politicians never campaign with the slogan, I'm the bad guy. Uh, so in order for the voter to know who to vote for, he would have to spend considerable amounts of time and effort figuring out uh, which candidate has done the right things. He gets no return for that in a country certainly as large as the U.S., but even as large as Australia, the chance that an individual vote will change the outcome is very close to zero. And therefore, a rational voter will choose to be rationally ignorant. He will decide who to vote for on grounds uh, such as who will his friends like his voting for, how will he please people around him, which candidate makes him feel better, uh, things and reasons of, of that sort. And that gives you what we're familiar with, a politics of sound bites and demagoguery. The anarcho-capitalism offers the decentralized version. Let me give you a very brief sketch of the relevant institutions for the details. You can see my book, The Machinery of Freedom. The second edition is free on my webpage. The third edition is an inexpensive Kindle on Amazon. But the basic logic of the system I want to argue for is that pr each private individual is the customer of a private firm that sells him the service of protecting his rights and settling his disputes. Each pair of such firms agree to a, have, they have disputes between their customers settled by a private court, an arbitration agency. The reason they agree to that is that fighting each other is expensive. If every time there's a conflict between their customers, they end up shooting at each other, they're going to have to pay pretty high hazard pay to their employees. Customers will not be happy to have their front lawns turned into free fire zones. And the individual will never know when his rights will or will not be protected. That all of us are better off if nobody can steal from anybody than if half the time I get to steal from you and half the time you get to steal from me, which is what happens if the outcome only depends on who happens to win the fight. So you have a system in which the individual firms, the individual rights enforcement agencies uh, are providing the service of rights enforcement and dispute settlement, and they are solving the conflicts between them by arbitration by private firms in, in that business, essentially private courts. What are the interests of the players in this system? From the standpoint of the rights enforcement agency, they want to provide the services that their customers want in order that they can have customers. And that means both doing a good job of protecting rights and providing their customers with a legal system their customers want to live under. Unlike the political situation, the customer actually has a choice that affects what he gets. Customers can't automatically get whatever law they want because it has to be a law that the uh, rights enforcement agency can get other rights enforcement agencies to accept. However, the customer can choose among rights enforcement agencies which one he will be a customer of. And one of the bases for doing that is which one has a legal system that he likes, which might be the rules. It might be how expensive litigation is. It could be any characteristic uh, of the system being provided by arbitration agencies that he cares about. So that means that it is in the interest of the rights enforcement agencies to do a good job of enforcing the law and is an interest of the arbitration agencies to make good law defined as law that people would like to live under. So far, I've told you why the system works. Let me now discuss what seemed to me as the three main problems with it. The first problem is national defense. How do you defend a stateless society against aggressive neighbors? Uh, and the reason that's a problem gets us back to the public good problem. If I spend resources on the military to defend my country, 
Uh, the result is that I provide a benefit, a decreased chance of a successful invasion shared with all of my fellow inhabitants of that country. So it is unlikely for it to be worth my doing that. However, public goods do actually get produced privately. There are quite a number of examples. Again, I go into this in more detail in the book of public goods that get produced privately through a variety of imperfect uh, mechanisms. The most obvious one is charity that if people think something is a worthy cause, they are willing to donate money to it, not because they expect to get a return, but because they think it's a good thing to do. And of course, in the US at present, I don't know about Australia, many billions of dollars are in fact donated for charity. A second reason is that people sometimes have a feeling of social obligation. Uh, they feel as though they ought to uh, pay for something even if they don't have to. Uh, the, my standard example of that is tipping that if you are at a restaurant you're not coming back to or are in a cab, in either case, you have no private benefit from tipping the driver or the waiter. Nonetheless, people do. That again is a flow of many billions of dollars and they do it because they feel as though that's how a decent person behaves. And in a well-functioning system of norms, uh, people feel that way to some extent your failure to contribute to what people see as the common good makes other people think less of you. You therefore have an incentive to do it. Finally, what I find in a way the most interesting case is that you produce the public good as a side effect of producing something else. Uh, and my example I'd like to offer for that is the public good that this very instant we are producing. I am currently spending time and effort listening and you in the audience are, sorry, I'm spending time and effort speaking and you in the audience are spending time and effort listening in order to spread ideas that we hope will make the world a better place. Making the world a better place is essentially a pure private, a pure public good. That if I make the world a better place, uh, I share the benefit of that with 8 billion people. And even if I limit it to, to my own country uh, with 300 million people. Nonetheless, we're doing it. Why do people do that? Not just for our side. Why do people engage in political activity uh, in favor of candidates, in favor of socialism, in favor of all sorts of different ideas, not just ours? Uh, and the answer, at least part of the answer, is that being part of a movement provides you benefits that don't depend on the success of the movement. That if you are a active libertarian, you are interacting with other active libertarians. They are people who share your values. They are people engaged in a common project. That's fun. Some of them might be people who become friends of yours. Finding friends is a fairly important human activity. One of them might even be a person who becomes a mate for you. Finding mates is a very important human activity. So in various ways, people get a benefit from participating in political activity that does not depend on their private benefit from the actual results of that activity. Uh, it follows that we might be able to raise sufficient resources to protect the stateless society. It does not follow that we can be sure we can. Uh, the standard economic argument of the sort I was making earlier suggests that we will predictably get the right answer to things. In this case, we do not know whether or not a stateless society can raise sufficient resources to defend itself depends partly on the culture of that society, on how willing people are to do expensive things uh, in order to protect their society, which varies a whole lot. My favorite example of a highly successful, though ultimately failed, uh, solution to this problem uh, would be the Comanche Indians. They were a stateless society, and rather than the problem being protecting them from other states, the problem was protecting their neighbors from them. Because in that society, you could get wealth and status by leading a war party and raiding the Mexicans or the Texans or whoever else uh, was available to be raided. Uh, so, so in any case, I think there are various ways by which we could raise some resources. And I spent one chapter in the uh, first edition of Machinery of Freedom and an additional chapter in the second, sketching what are some of the possible ways of doing it. It's also going to depend on how serious the threat is. My view is that the U.S. can probably manage just fine without a government so far as defending itself, assuming that society is functioning reasonably well. We have large Y oceans on either side of us, 
and our neighbors to north and south are not very powerful and not very aggressive. So it's not going to take very large resources from charity or from something else to protect ourselves. Australia, I'm less certain. Australia also has an ocean, which is a useful thing to have, but they are a smaller society and they have at least one rather aggressive neighbor who could conceivably be a threat. What about Estonia? And my initial reaction thinking about that was it's hopeless for Estonia. Uh, Estonia is a small country with a very powerful and rather aggressive neighbor. But it turns out that in fact, people in Estonia are engaged in the private production of national defense. Somebody pointed me at an article and it turns out that there are a bunch of people in Estonia who in effect have the hobby of training themselves for guerrilla warfare. And the basic theory of that, as I understand it, is not that they think that Russia could not conquer Estonia if it was willing to pay a high enough price to do it. What they think is that if they have a lot of people equipped and trained for guerrilla warfare, they can make conquering Estonia more expensive than it's worth to the Russians. And that's an application of an important economic principle that many people miss. And that is that in order to prevent somebody from doing something you don't want them to do, you don't have to make it impossible. You only have to make it unprofitable. You can leverage your opponent's rationality. So that's one problem. One very serious problem is national defense. Second problem is a problem of internal breakdown. In particular, what happens if the rights enforcement agencies decide that robbery is more profitable than business and they get together and reinvent government? They could do it by each of them agreeing not to take customers who used to be customers of the others to eliminate the competition. They could do it by merging. Judging by what we know of the formation of, cart of cartels in, in other industries, how likely that is to happen is going to depend very largely on how many rights enforcement agencies there are. That if there are only two and three, the si two or three, the situation could easily be unstable and you could easily end up back with government as they decide to get together. If there were two or three hundred, on the other hand, I think that becomes very unlikely. Uh, how many firms there are going to be, as any economist could tell you, depends on economies of scale, on whether it turns out that the size of firm which can do the best job uh, at the cost is huge or small. We can't predict that for certain. I sketched some reasons in machinery to think it probably will not be terribly huge, but I could be wrong. And of course, the one other protection against that is if the populace is armed and if enough people are willing to fight if somebody tries to reinvent uh, government. Uh, Final problem I wanted to list is what I think of as market failure on the market for law. Markets do not work perfectly, even if libertarians would like to think that they do. There are a collection of problems that economists refer to as market failure, of which the public good problem, that goods sometimes don't get produced even though they're worth producing because the producer can't control who gets them and therefore can't arrange to get paid for them, is one example. Externalities such as air pollution are another familiar example, and there are one or two others that are, are, are less, less familiar to, to most people. And I like to describe market failure as a situation where individual rationality fails to produce group rationality, where because the individuals are not each paying the cost and, and receiving the benefit of their action, it is sometimes in their interest to do things that make all of them, them worse off. I could go into more detail on that, but not in a 20-minute talk. Uh, there are a bunch of my talks up on my webpage, and you can hear almost all expansions of these things by re-listing to, to some of them. Uh, so my conclusion, oh, the mar so market failure is going to exist on the market for law. I've gone into some detail on how it could happen. There are various ways in which it will not produce perfect law. On the other hand, the regular market doesn't produce perfect automobiles or perfect uh, food either. Nonetheless, the evidence suggests that the market failures associated with private markets tend to be much smaller and much less serious than the market failures associated with the political system. That in the private market, people sometimes don't bear quite all of the cost of their actions. In the political market, they generally bear essentially none of the cost and usually get almost none of the benefit of their actions. So I think it is reasonable to suggest that the system I'm describing will not work perfectly, but it will probably work about as well as other markets work. 
And the relevant comparison is to how well the alternative, which is socialism, uh, our governmental system in a sense is socialism. Uh, uh, that is to say, it's government control and production of a particular means of, uh, of, of product, government co control, ownership and control of a particular means of production, namely the production of law and law enforcement. So the fundamental point I want you to remember is that you have to consider government not as we want it to be, but as we can expect it to be. The problems that I described with government earlier apply to minarchy as well as to our present situation. In general, it is a great mistake made by people of all political views to put your argument in terms of the results you want. That's a mistake made by both socialists and libertarians. The socialist wants the government that produces efficiently and distributes justly, but he has no mechanism to make an actual socialist government act that way, and we observe ones and they don't. The libertarian minarchist wants a government that has a monopoly of force, but only uses it to protect rights. Uh, one proposed mechanism is a constitution. We've done that experiment already. Uh, another is philosophy. But if you could really persuade everybody to believe in respecting rights so strongly uh, that he would never take an opportunity to use the political system to benefit himself, you don't really need a government. You now have a population of saints, which I think is also unlikely. So that's basically what I have to say. I will now turn this over to Brian Kaplan. I should perhaps mention that Brian, among his many other distinctions, features in one of my books. I don't name him as it happens, but it is a discussion of how norms get changed. And I describe an unnamed professor who succeeds in changing the norms of scholarly dress at his university by being willing to defy them. Thank you. Switch to Brian. All right, we're gonna have to unmute you there, Brian. Are you ready? You're, you're unmuted now, you're good. Okay, very good. All right now, so David and I are talking about a very radical idea, free market anarchism, anarcho-capitalism. Uh, I am a big student of history and I have to say, radical ideas have a terrible track record. Almost all radical ideas end in fire and blood of course, there is the sad tale of communism in the 20th, 20th century. You've got Islamist revolutions in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and since. Uh, you've got the Protestant Reformation. You've got the French Revolution. In any case, radical ideas have done very poorly. And a very natural reaction, I would say, is no radical ideas ever. Radical ideas are terrible, and we will just avoid them from now on, and all wise people will do the same. All right, I'm very sympathetic to this idea, but there is another confounding variable to keep in mind, which is how hard did radicals try to really work out the details of how their system was supposed to work in advance? Right? You can think of this as the due diligence part, where you say, here's my radical idea, here are all the major objections, I'm going to calmly go through them, I'm going to talk to people who disagree, I'm going to find out what could go wrong, I'm going to reply, I'm going to wait and, and elicit replies to the reply, we're going to do research, we're going to put a lot of time into this. All right. So anyway, this uh, says that there's really two possibilities of what could be going wrong with radical ideas, and one is just radical ideas are bad. Another one is that radicals are highly impatient and impulsive individuals as a rule, and if we could get rid of that if we could be careful, intellectually scrupulous, we could actually find radical ideas that are very solid and we could predict in advance that they would work and our predictions would generally be right. Okay, so I wanna put that on the table and say that the kind of stuff that Dave and I are doing, I think of it, it's the proper diligence that any radical should take. Uh, this is assuming the burden of proof, saying like, I understand that, that you will, you'll be skeptical. If you have any sense, you will be skeptical. And I'm going to do my best to overcome your skepticism and not by intimidating you or acting like you're a bad person for not immediately agreeing with me. Rather, I am going to assume that you think that I'm crazy and try to win you over. Right? Indeed, generally, whenever I put forward a radical idea, I say my goal here is not to think, make you think that I'm right. My goal here is to convince you that I'm not crazy. And once I've got that, then we can begin a really good conversation. All right, so think about this as my chance to convince you that this idea is not crazy. Uh, now, let me just start with what I call the great minarchist myth. So there is a longstanding idea among people who advocate the minimal state, or even people who don't, saying, 
look, the smallest possible government you could have is one that has a monopoly over the police, a monopoly over courts, a monopoly over rule formation. That's the absolute smallest any government ever has been and ever can be. All right. Now, here's the interesting thing. You, so many people listen to that, even free market economists, and you got no idea. Yes, yes, yes. That's the way things all have to be. And then there's this crazy idea that wouldn't have to be a monopoly. But here's the thing. When you look at the real world, I don't know of any remotely free market co economy that really has a monopoly over any of these things. Virtually every country, you know, even ones that have a big role for government, have some private police, private security guards. Sometimes they got guns, sometimes they got batons, but they are people who actually are there to threaten violence if need be, to protect property, to protect lives. These are industries in almost every country. You can see them. So the idea that you must have a government monopoly in police is just obviously wrong because almost nowhere has a monopoly police. Uh, for courts, we also see that almost everywhere has a alternate system of dispute resolution besides government courts. So any place where you're using credit cards, there's likely to be an internal credit card arbitration system set up by the credit card companies. When there is a disputed charge, almost never will this end up in court. Instead, credit card companies have a system for trying to resolve the system internally. The same thing goes for insurance companies. And a great deal of a great many contractual disputes are also resolved through private arbitration rather than by going to courts. Uh, then what about rule formation? Once again, anytime you've got private courts, you are likely to have a whole system of private rule formation. So Visa does not come up with the rules anew every time there's a dispute. Instead, they have a body of internal rules. When there is an insurance dispute, they don't make up the rules each time there's a dispute. They've got a body of insurance rules that they've hammered out. When you have a dispute with Facebook or Twitter or an online provider, they've got a system set up. There's private rule formation going on already. And so this too is not a monopoly. All right. Uh, now, by itself, this doesn't show that you could have no government role, but just to realize how casually people say that this must be a government monopoly when it's not already a government monopoly should make you realize that people really are just not being that careful when they think about this issue and then raise the question, well, given that we got some, right, and, and things have not collapsed, it's plausible that the optimal amount of private police, private courts, private law enforcement isn't zero, right, and then, all right, well, then maybe we should have more, right? It's not often that you hear anyone complaining about private security guards, private courts, private rule formation. Seems to be working well. In fact, people complain about it a lot less than the government side. So then there's the question, well, could we have more? And if we could have more, how far could we possibly go, right? And this is where economic analysis, economic history all come into play. Uh, so we can take a look at areas where you could expand the role of private police, right? So right now, of course, there are limits on what private police can do. Why not allow more of it, right? Why not allow a greater role for private police to have more weapons, for example? So in some countries, they're not going to let them have guns. Would it really be so bad if, pri if uh, private security could have guns in some cases, right? So there's that, right? Or would it really be so bad if in large homeowner associations, the government police said, we're only going to take people that have been arrested by your security guards into custody, but if there's a problem there, it's up to your security guards in order to handle it because that's your area, right? So you could do that. So these are areas that private police could easily be expanded. Uh, in the case of private courts, uh, this is one where there's even more room. Because you know, right now there is something in some countries called binding arbitration, but the reality is that binding arbitration is almost never truly binding. You can almost always weasel out of binding arbitration. And from the point of view of normal people, you can understand why, because if you had truly binding arbitration, then you could actually effectively deregulate a wide range of industries. For example, suppose that you had private arbitration in employment contracts. Well, in this case, the minimum wage effectively doesn't exist anymore because if it were legal, then whenever someone was, was hired by you, you could say, well, you have to sign this private arbitration contract. It says that in the event of any dispute about proper payment of wages, it will be resolved by an arbitration company run by my brother-in-law, who always rules in my favor. And if you don't like it, you don't work here, right? And this is a way that you could actually completely undermine regulations that are widely popular. 
Of course, if you're at all interested in something like anarcho-capitalism, you probably think these are bad laws and this is a feature, not a bug of private arbitration. But in any case, so you could get a much larger role for private arbitration if you know, there were truly binding arbitration. And furthermore, you could go further. So for example, government courts could very easily say, well, there's no reason why we should ever have to hear a contract case because if there's a contract, you could have a binding arbitration clause. And then all our role would be is to look at the contract and see, see that it says binding arbitration. And once we realize this, then why should we ever have to hear a case? Why not say, if it doesn't say binding arbitration, tough luck, it's not enforceable. And in this way, you could take all contract disputes and move them over to the private sector quite easily. Right? And then obviously, once you have a much larger role for private courts, it is quite easy to expand the role for private rule formation. And once again, of course, this is a case where if government says, look, these are private companies, they've got their own rules, it's not our place to say whether we like the rules or not, caveat emptor, you know, don't sign up with a company where you don't like the rules. Right? I mean, this, of course, is what I think of as the reasonable answer to all internet privacy concerns. Look, if you don't like the way Facebook handles your information, then drop out of Facebook. Otherwise, tough luck. You can complain, but you have no business turning to government for it. And again, this is the way that you could handle private rule formation in general, right? So there is that. All right, now for all of these, we can start with marginal reforms. And let me just say that you have to be very dogmatic to deny that we can do marginal increases in the role of private police, private courts, and private rules. And furthermore, given that there's very little complaining or the complaints are really quite trivial and childish, like Facebook is going and using my, pri my private information in ways that I don't like, um, you know, but of course, I'm not willing to drop out of Facebook. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, so anyway, uh, so, you know, there's, you know, there's, it would be very childish to say that you can't have marginal reforms in the direction of more of this. And indeed, when you start thinking about the marginal reforms, the marginal reforms could go pretty far. Again, things like there are no more private, uh, there are no more uh, public contract cases. You can no longer sue someone over breach of contract in a public court. All that you can do is say, we got binding arbitration and then and then take it to your private court. And if the person doesn't pay, then you can hand it over to the government and say, see, it says they have to pay. There's no appeal, the end of story. All right. Uh, now, when things start getting interesting is when you're talking about radical reform. All right, how far could we really go? Uh, now I'd say, of course, to most people having, a, uh, having binding arbitration for all contracts is already pretty radical, but we could go a lot further than that. And this is a lot of what David Friedman was talking about in his talk. Uh, so I will be a little bit less detailed here. Uh, but when you, when you think about areas where we can have really radical reform, all right? So for example, here you could say, we're not just going to have a bigger role for private security companies. We are going to defund the police and say, look, if you don't think you're getting adequate police protection, then you should go and hire some security guards. Um, now, my colleague Alex Tabarrok has done quite a bit of work on the effectiveness of police, and I think he does some very convincing studies showing that in the current environment, police generally, uh, you know, so having more police, not more imprisonment, but more police specifically, uh, you know, passes a cost-benefit test. And what I would say to this is, this is, these are all thinking about marginal changes within the confines of the current system. You're not really thinking about what if in addition to defunding the police, you also were to greatly expand the role for private security to change what they are able to do, to change the presumptions, right? So there's so many, you know, so many more things that you could do in order to give private police a larger role, right? Again, you know, everything up to saying, look, when you enter into a place of business, you have consented to the, uh, to, uh, to the jurisdiction of the place that, that has you there. And again, of course, this doesn't mean that you are going to be murdered by police with any likelihood or <laughs> when you get there. It means that you that uh, you're going to be relying upon competition to protect you, which I will say in my experience is more than adequate. Uh, yeah, I don't think you have to worry very much about being hassled by private security. Definitely, there are fewer scandals involving private security than government than than, than government police. All right, and again, in terms of more radical reforms for the courts. Here, you can even go further than just saying, we don't enforce private contracts. Uh, it's up to you to have a binding arbitration clause. Instead, you could even go further and say, even if you don't have a contract, what, all, what, what this means that when you come to the government courts, we just say, well, here's a list of arbitrators. Each of you can cross off a third of the names and then, you have, then you, one of the remaining names gets picked. And then again, we enforce whatever that mutually agreed arbitrator says that this will happen. 
right? Uh, so, and again, of course, once you have this bigger role for private courts, then this also leads to a big expansion in the possible role for private rule formation. You know, on the theme of if you don't like the rules, then you need to go and find a different place to take your take your business, different place to work, different different apartment complex, different homeowner association, and so on. All right. So now all these cases, it's very easy to say, all right, fine. We'll just keep paring away the role of government until finally all that we're down to is the the military of the central government, and they'll be there as the force of last resort. Where if everyone else says no, 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 we're not going to go and adhere by the by the terms of the deal, then finally you got the military say, oh yes, you will. We've got more weapons than any individual company, and you will comply. All right, so that's already, of course, an extremely minimal government. In fact, you might be tempted to tempted to call it subminimal, although that's grammatically it doesn't make any sense. But you know, below the minimum of what people have imagined hitherto is the way that you could put it. So this is a government so small that it's just a military that polices the police, the private police, just a military that polices the, the private courts and so on. All right. Now, this is a case where on the one hand, you might say, well, when it's that small, why worry about getting rid of anything? Why worry about getting rid of the last bit? I think if you're listening to David Friedman, you'll have the idea, of, well, as long as there's that last little core, then there is the risk that the core starts growing back up again. Better to just go and remove that last core and whatever fears you have about maybe the uh, you know, maybe, maybe one part of the system will go bad should also apply to the core as well. So in that case, you're saying, well, maybe we'll just pull the pin and see whether the system is stable, right? So you've got a stand for the earth and you're like, well, the earth stand is what's keeping the earth in place. Maybe, maybe if we just release it, it turns out the earth floats in space all of its own, of its own accord. All right. Um, now, uh, when I think about the, you know, like, like the plausibility of this whole idea, I often, often compare it to the rise of democracy. So I ask this question, imagine you go back to 10th century Sweden and you say, hey, here's an idea. Let's go and have a system of de called democracy where whenever we're trying to pick a leader, we go and we scratch our, scratch, our, scratch our rune into a little piece of clay and then we count them all. And then whoever has the most runes gets to be the leader for a few years. And you just imagine all the Vikings laughing in ancient Swedish accents going, oh, ha, 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 that's a ridiculous, right? You said, why is it ridiculous? Then they would say, well, whoever it is that loses, you know, like, you know, like, you know, if the person who currently has power loses, loses this election, they'll just go and murder the winner and they'll continue to rule. So what's the point, right? And here's the thing, in 10th century, in the world of 10th century Vikings, this argument probably makes a lot of sense. This is what people are expecting. It is a world where they're expecting that might makes right. And so if you tried having democracy in that environment, it would just be a joke and it wouldn't work. However, flash forward to 21st century Sweden and imagine that the current government of Sweden loses the election and then someone in the government meeting says, you know, I say we just to kill our enemies and stay in power now. Now people laugh at that guy, right? That's what's funny now, right? Or, you know, of course, if you push it, then people think you're crazy rather than funny. But you know, what's changed? And I say what's changed is expectations. In a system where people expect that it's going to be ruled by violence, then you'll have rule by violence. In a system where people expect that you will respect democracy, then democracy is, uh, is a stable equilibrium. And the person who says otherwise, it just gets ostracized as being a lunatic. And I say that free market anarchism is something where once it is expected, once established, we should really expect it to be just as stable as democracy or any number of other systems. It's really a question of just getting of getting over the hump, getting to be a system that people accept, expect. It doesn't even need enthusiastic support so much as just something where it's the kind of thing that when you say, you know, let's go murder our enemies and the other companies and seize control, instead of people saying, hmm, could we get away with it? They'll just laugh uneasily and say, yeah, yeah that's, that's ridiculous. Of course, in the same way that right now, if the head of an, of an alcohol company said, let's go and murder the other uh, CEOs of all the other alcohol companies and and corner the market, and people would just think that was ludicrous. Whereas during the era of prohibition, that would, that would have made a lot of sense to people. All right. Uh, now, by the way, so David mentioned the case of national defense in the military. So you have a somewhat different perspective. So I am um, highly skeptical of guerrilla warfare as something that you should count on or that feel like, oh, well, we could always fall back on guerrilla warfare. 
Uh, to me, guerrilla warfare is something that when it happens, it normally is just a total disaster and uh, just uh, like, like awful. Um, Murray Rothbard is this bizarre idea. Oh, guerrilla warfare is potentially very libertarian. Say like, well, show me any actual case of guerrilla warfare that ever was. Show me any actual case of guerrilla show up at a village in need of supplies and recruits. And they tell the villagers, hey, we could use some supplies and recruits. And the village says, sorry, we don't want to help you. We don't want the government punishing us. Plus, we don't feel like it. And the guerrillas say, oh, well, in that case, we'll just move on. Sorry. Right? That's not how guerrillas operate. Guerrillas operate at best with a threat of violence of a very severe kind. And in practice, they don't even, they, it isn't even just a subtle threat. They just say, look, do what we say or your bad things will happen to you. But anyway, my, my view on the military is this. I think we're already moving very much in a direction where military power is of very little political relevance. There are now a great many countries where it's just absurd to think that the more military powerful country would ever militarily threaten the less militarily powerful one. Like no one is, no one in Canada is worried. Almost no one in the U.S. would it poses any military threat to them, even though we could totally beat them very easily. Right within the EU, the idea that one member of the EU might turn back to its old ways and rearm and then start attacking other countries. It's just ridiculous. And it's ridiculous in the same way that someone in Sweden today saying, let's go and murder the opposition and then we can reign as dictators is ridiculous. It's not even that it wouldn't work. It's that it is so far beyond the realm of plausibility that you would just seem like a joke if you tried pushing for it. So I'd say we've already got a big move in this direction. And I think even the countries that are still not uh, that are still not part of this mindset have been very much moving the moving this direction just the changed attitude towards loss of the lives of a few soldiers you can really see this in most countries where like even even you know even the deaths of a thousand soldiers would be a big deal whereas in earlier times thousand soldiers who, who need to know what difference does it make we've got plenty more where that came from all right and then furthermore there's also uh the you know, i think you know, dave is making fun of the role of ideology i think that you don't need something where people are saintly you just need it to be there, to be in the air as something that tips the scales of, 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 of aggression enough that there is no longer the will to do it. Here, I think very much about the case, you know, the Soviet Union was the world's only communist government for two decades. You might say Mongolia was, but anyway, like basically the only one for two decades. But there was no serious effort to get rid of it. There were some extremely half-hearted efforts to push the communists out uh, towards the end of World War I. But if you go and look at it, there's, there's basically nothing. It's mostly Soviet propaganda to say that there was any effort to strangle communism in the cradle. And um, you know, a lot of it was just guarding supply depots and ports and things like that. Right. And I say that I mean, what, what, you know, like a lot of what was going on is that there was a worldwide communist movement of sympathizers and fellow travelers uh, who in, uh, in all the countries that might've been tempted to go and try to topple the Soviet Union, they were there to complain and make a stink about it. And that was plenty, even in the old days, of the British empire, the French empire. And I say like in any realistic world where you've got actual anarcho-capitalist countries coming up, there's going to be the same fifth column of fellow travelers that are undermining efforts of aggression. And again, given the way the world is turning, uh, uh, turning towards uh, something like universal peace over the long run. I just am not nearly as worried as David is. When David started writing, the Soviet Union was still around, and then I would have been terrified, uh, but not anymore. All right, and then last question. So who cares about any of this stuff, right? It just seems so far from the realm of possibility that it doesn't seem to matter very much. I'd say two things. So one is, as I've been emphasizing, you can have a lot of moderate reforms in the direction, the direction that I'm talking about. And actually, the internet has done so much for private rule formation, private adjudication, and again, you know, even private punishments like ostracism and so on have grown a great deal due to the internet. So just pushing it as something in the direction of moderate reform, I think is worthwhile. Uh, but I do think that even though it is very remote, holding this ideal and talking about it and thinking about it is intellectually of great importance because it means that there is a full radical intellectual critique of the existing system out there. It means that when people say democracy is the best system of government, except for all the others, libertarians do have a good answer to that. It's like, yeah, well, how about anarcho-capitalism? What about that? So I'll leave you there. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Brian. And thank you, uh, David, as well. We are running uh, preciously low on time. We'll try and sneak in a quick question like, uh, with a couple of quick answers. First one is, what are we to make of the anarcho communists, or as uh, Brian wonderfully called them in, a, uh, in an essay I read 10 years ago, the anarcho-statists. 
when you mm -hmm. refer to the anarcho statists of Spain. And I guess leading on from that, do we have a marketing issue where we should probably try and avoid using the same word as uh, ANCOMs? Um, is there a better word to describe what we're talking about? Should we consider rebadging and improving marketing of the idea? Uh, David, your mic's off, by the way. David, if you wanted to speak, you'll need to unmute yourself. I think the fundamental problem that the anarcho-communists face is that they have no solution to the uh, problem of coordinating people, that they are rejecting the only system we know of for decentralized coordination on a large scale, that is markets and prices, uh, and the result is that they end up with zero zero solutions. It's rather like Mao, who it turns out was in favor of decentralization, but the only version of decentralization he could imagine was lots of very large communes, but still a large number of them, and that worked very poorly. So China kept bouncing back and forth between failed decentralization and failed centralization. Uh, I will let Brian comment on the question of how best to label ourselves. Yes. So in the mid-90s, I spent about two years arguing with left-wing anarchists and uh, the, the culmination of that was that essay, The Anarcho Status of Spain, that you mentioned. And my mature view is talking to them is a complete waste of time and we should never do it. All right. Uh, I want to talk to reasonable, moderate people. Uh, so people where we've got some intellectual common ground, I think they're just crazy and uh, so emotional and rational that it's just a waste of time, honestly. Uh, so once in a very long while, you'll find a person who said, well, I started off with anarcho-communism and then became an anarcho-capitalist. Right. And like, all right. Hmm. Right. That's interesting. But, you know, if that happens, great. But, you know, I just think that's so rare that to put any intellectual energy into it is a mistake. Right. And, you know, I would say the problem is much more serious than what David says. It's not just a problem of they don't want to come up with a mechanism. It's a problem where they don't want to have an, a normal conversation where people calm down and actually exchange ideas. I think that, you know, my experience with them is they are a very thinly veiled totalitarian movement. Uh, they don't you know, they, they, they want to rule through intimidation and anger. They don't want to learn any of the subjects that are, that are relevant. They don't want to find out what people disagree with them think. So I've studied them enough and I don't want to give them any more of my time. And I would just rather talk to mainstream people uh, in a, where you can have a, a decent conversation. In terms of branding ourselves, I would say I would never just use the word anarchist because then most people think of anarcho-communists or anarcho-socialists. Anarcho-capitalists or free market anarchists is so oxymoronic to people who know the other kind that I think it's actually fine, right? It's, you know, so it's something where people say, well, that doesn't sound at all. That sounds like the opposite of what those other guys are talking about. And you're saying, you know what it is, right? Because in the end, when anarcho, the, the few cases where anarcho-communists or anarcho-socialists have gained power, they basically have just imposed Stalinism, right? So some, sometimes chaotic Stalinism, but still that's where they end up. And, I, and, I, and in the end, I don't think it's because they, they were drawn through some desperate logic. Instead, I think it's because that's basically what they had planned all along and it's an Orwellian movement where uh, when they say freedom, they mean slavery. Yep. Well, in that case, let's put them in the dustbin of this conversation. Uh, and we've got one last quick question. Um, David, when you wrote The Machinery of Freedom, how was that received by your father, Milton Friedman? Uh, he approved of it. Uh, he, my memory is the one criticism I can remember his making was that I had proved too much, that I had demonstrated that government would work catastrophically badly, and if it was really that catastrophic, we would all be dead by now. Uh, in terms of the general issue of whether my system would work, uh, my view was and is that it probably would but might not, and his view was that it probably wouldn't but might. And that's not the kind of disagreement on which, since neither of us is in a position to actually do calculations on probabilities, it's not the kind of disagreement you can have much of an argument over. All right. Uh, we've just been told that our camera's frozen. Hopefully you can still hear us. So uh, that's still working. Um, I, I believe we're running out of time on this one. By the way, I had a sneaking suspicion. The, the way Milton wrote always seemed to me the way you would write if you were secretly an anarchist but didn't want to admit it publicly. So I don't, I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to continue believing it because I hope it's true. Um, but uh, I think that that's enough time for this one. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for, for joining us here. I hope you'll stick around if you have a bit of spare time in the social room. I'm sure there's plenty of people there that would love to pick your brains about many more issues. But at this point, uh, thanks a lot. And I'm going to throw to the Melbourne studio. Thanks so much.